Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. We have Jack Morrison with us today. Jack is the co-founder and CEO of Scythe Robotics. Scythe is helping to improve the efficiency and sustainability of the landscaping industry with autonomous, all-electric robots optimized for working in unstructured outdoor environments. The Series B they closed last year was led by Energy Impact Partners, which signals to me that this isn't just a big business opportunity, but it's significant for the planet. Scythe tackles climate change in at least two ways. They're moving the industry away from gas-powered machines to all-electric, and actually the emissions impact potential there is a lot bigger than I would have guessed. The other is about enhancing and increasing the amount of green space in urban and suburban communities. We'll talk about both of those things and why they're important in more detail in a bit. But to introduce Jack quickly, he studied computer science in college and has spent his career in computer vision and spatial computing. Prior to founding Scythe in 2018, he co-founded a company called Replica Labs that enabled 3D scanning using cameras on phones and tablets. That company was acquired in 2016. And according to his bio, he lives with his wife on a small farm in Colorado. Jack, thanks a lot for joining us. It's good to have you. Thanks for having me, Dylan. Tell me about the farm. I want to start there. What do you got going on there? The farm has gotten a lot bigger since I think I wrote that bio. My wife's a horse trainer, and we've got about 30 horses now on the property just outside Loveland, Colorado. Yeah, it's a beautiful spot and lets me have a really interesting day job in technology and building robots. And then weekend, I'm a very bad part-time farmhand get to <laughs> muck manure and help care for the horses just a tiny bit. But she works far harder than I do, which is saying something when you start to have a couple of married founders of different businesses. <laughs> nice. Sounds awesome. You got a lot of grass to mow there? Ironically, I have less grass on the horse farm than I did on our smaller property closer to Boulder because there's just horse stuff everywhere. But we have about three acres. I take the machines home every weekend to mow. Last weekend, I actually had four of them on the property, three mowing autonomously all at once. And then I was riding a fourth and doing the cleanup work around it. Made it go (laughs) quite quickly. Nice. I'd love to hear how Scythe started. What got you into this in the first place? Yeah, I got into robots, making them play soccer in undergrad, just loved robotics and programming from the beginning, got pretty obsessed with the ability to change the physical world through software. I think that was something you don't get in computer science classes when you're building little GUIs or working on red black trees or sort of theoretical things. And then spent, like you said, about 10 years working in disembodied computer vision, but got to see the development of the technology. I had a brief stint in a PhD before realizing the startup world was much more interesting than what I was going to get out of academia. And like you said, it started and sold a 3D scanning company, wanted to get back into the full stack robotics realm and really had a few criteria. One, wanted something that wasn't going to take a billion dollars to get kind of a basic MVP out on the market. Wanted to have something that would have a big impact that actually was good and positive for the world. And then finally, wanted something that could actually make money that provided value to people, which is a rarity in robotics applications. I kind of had a light bulb moment mowing my own acre and a half lawn closer to Boulder of like, I'm bad at this. I hate this. (laughs) And there is just a ton of grass in this country. I don't think most people know actually almost 2% of the lower 48 is covered in turf grass. So that's grass that gets mowed every week. Yeah, it's a lot of lawnmowers out there turn all that tall grass into short grass. And when I saw that, just clicked for me that this was this big beachhead into how we take care of our planet. And there's been a lot of talk about going to other planets and I don't know, is Earth doomed? And I don't think it is. I think we can save this planet. I think we can treat it substantially better than we have for centuries. And our baby step in that direction is to turn all of the 
fossil fuel powered manual equipment that we use to do that work into zero emission electrified autonomous equipment to scale humanity's ability to cultivate green space. Did you look at other robotics applications very seriously before settling on this? Yeah, we thought about a whole bunch, indoor and outdoor ag construction, poked around in these different industries and ended up really liking a few things about the landscaping industry. One major one being it's been basically entirely overlooked by technology forever, essentially. Hmm. The last big innovation in mowing was you can stand on your mower instead of sitting on it. And that was like 40 years ago. And since then, they've basically been all the same. Even the few electric models that have come out are pretty bad and pretty basic and resemble the gas mowers they're modeled on, except they're worse in a whole bunch of ways. And then the industry dynamics are just really interesting to us. This is a market that's been told automation was coming for a really long time. They're really hungry for ways to be more positive. Like these are people who spend all day taking care of the planet, of cultivating all this green space. And yet the tools they are given by OEMs are like so obviously polluting (laughs) that it's tough for them to reconcile that sometimes. They would like to be zero emission, but they need to have the power that they get from the gas machines today. And they need the efficiency that they just can't get with the electric machines. And so all of this sort of clicked to make it a great market for us to enter with the first machine. How much, I mean, 2018, I feel like the conversation around sustainability and climate was really different. How much was that part of the business a driving factor for you at that time? And how has that changed since then? It's always been a core part of the mission. Like, I love being outside. We're here in Colorado. We're blessed with so much natural, beautiful space. I grew up camping in the woods of Wisconsin. Getting outside has always been really important to me and taking care of the world around us. The climate change and the electrification angle is definitely a core part of why we are building an all-electric machine from the beginning. There's also the benefit to autonomy of having an electric machine, like controlling a gas-powered vehicle, be it a lawnmower or an on-road car, is just incredibly hard. And that's why you've seen, I think, all of the self-driving car companies go to electric vehicles because it simplifies everything. And for us, From day one, it was the way we could slide, sneak electrification into the landscaping industry because they don't, a lot of the contractors, they can't afford the more expensive electric equipment. It doesn't bring a big boost to their business. But if we build an autonomous machine that does bring that value, then we can make it electric, decarbonize their operations while providing them a very real benefit. You know, we green tax is not a thing any landscaper, almost any landscaper will pay. And we get to do this without a tax. It's just better autonomy. Got it. So your customers are more motivated by the autonomy than electrification. A hundred percent. The electrification is just, that's for us and for the planet. What we give them is a very low upfront cost autonomous machine that helps them grow their business and can help them win contracts who want electric landscaping equipment. There are a handful of those big corporate campuses are starting to push for all electric equipment being used on them. It's one of the criteria or can help towards some of the higher lead certification for sustainable building practices is making sure your landscaping is sustainable as well. So there are these little fringe benefits, but yeah, mostly they care that it's autonomous and that it helps them grow their business. I want to spend a a little bit on why this is important to the climate and just try to help quantify that and put it in context of climate change. So I said this in the intro, and tell me if I have this right. It's kind of this, there's like two major factors to think about what you're doing from a climate change perspective. One is about the emissions reduction and decarbonization of this industry. And actually, I think about like VOCs as well and sort of air quality, which is a little different. And then the other would be this enhancement and proliferation of green space in our communities. I was hoping you could elaborate on both of those and why those are important things for us to be thinking about. Would love to. There's a whole range of reasons that electrifying landscaping equipment is beneficial for the environment. Climate change focused improvements are definitely a huge chunk of that. But like even before we get to that, you touched on the VOCs are huge. The gas that's burned in a lawnmower, a two-stroke weed whacker is like barely fully combusted. There's so much unburnt gasoline in there. There's so many 
chemicals, particles coming out of it. None of these lawnmowers or small engines have catalytic converters or any of the things that are on modern passenger vehicles. And so the stats are something like it's a couple hundred miles of driving in a passenger vehicle to create the same amount of air pollution that mowing with a typical commercial lawnmower creates in an hour. So we're talking almost a day's worth of driving to create what effectively you create mowing your home lawn. And that's just bad. That's bad for everyone's health outcomes. Yeah. And why is that? Because I've heard that you can almost like see it in the air when you see these machines, right? Why is it Is it about regulation or is there a technology challenge or what is that about? Yeah, there's next to no regulation of small engines. California just banned, so the California Air Resource Board car banned small gas lawnmowers recently for sale. So you can't buy in California as of, I think this year, you can't buy a small gas lawnmower anymore because they see the effects it has. But Yeah, it's two part. The regulation to stop them hasn't been there to like force them to improve. I think the traditional OEMs have lobbied well to keep that from coming in. And then the electric equipment to replace it just hasn't made its way in. So there's been no push. And I think the final thing is just these machines that landscapers are using are built to be so cheap. And that's partly because everyone wants cheaper equipment. But if you think about the business model of an OEM, in most industries, frankly, but landscaping in particular, they survive off of new mower sales, which means you have to get rid of your old mower, probably, or parts in service, which means your mower has to break down, basically. And so their incentive is to drive the cost of these machines all the way down, not to add nice new safety features or things like passenger vehicles do of making them cleaner, competing on mileage, Basically, their one motive is to make it cheaper because that's the only way that they're able to attract new customers in a commodity marketplace. And the VOCs, is that mostly a human health impact or what else is (laughs) bad about that? Yeah, the VOCs is largely a human health impact. It causes, in here in Denver, Salt Lake will have it, you get this brown cloud, the inversions where the bad air quality in the kind of quasi-valley that Denver or Salt Lake are just hovers above the city and makes these terrible air quality days. There's also nitrous oxide that's a large component of the mower emissions, which is a greenhouse gas, I think, in that it reacts with the sunlight at these high altitudes and massively increases the amount of ozone in the air. I guess there was a stat by the Colorado Air Resources Commission that if we just electrified all of the lawnmowers in the greater Denver area, the Colorado and Denver in particular, would finally come under the ozone limits that they've been exceeding for like 40 years. Basically, Denver and Colorado have had a waiver from the EPA for the fact that they've had terrible ozone for decades now. I think our governor finally just stopped applying for that waiver to make it real that we need to fix this problem. But yeah, all of this unburnt fuel and nitrous oxide converts into ozone at the high altitude in the sunlight. That's a human health thing. That's a bit of a climate change thing. It's just problematic all around. Okay, so that's VOCs. And then there's just pure, there's the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, I guess. Yeah, so it's CO2 emissions and then just like hydrocarbons, just the sort of methane-ish emissions that are a big component of it. And what our research showed us is somewhere between 30 and 40 million metric tons annually produced by commercial mowers in the U.S. of CO2 equivalent gases, basically. So that's on par with all of the emissions from agricultural fuel use or from railroads, like these segments of the industry that produce goods, either move things around or produce all the food we eat, all the fuel going into that is roughly equivalent to the emissions or creates roughly the same emissions as caring for all of our turf grass, basically, which feels silly to me. And actually just the commercial mowers, right? Yeah, and just the commercial, right. So we're not even talking about all the home mowers that are probably even cheaper, probably even older, (laughs) often two-stroke engines that are even dirtier. And there are millions of sitting in garages around the country. So yeah, it's a big, that's somewhere around a percent or so of annual emissions in the country. So it's not going to fix the problem all by itself, but it's a non-trivial amount of gases that we release. 
caring for these outdoor spaces. Yeah. And then how should we be thinking about the value of the green space that these machines are helping to maintain? Totally. That's another one where it's part just the human capital side, the human health side. There's all this research on how beneficial it is to even just live by green space. You don't even have to go to it. You don't have to like spend weekends in the park, but just having a park nearby and driving by it on your commute, walking by it on your way to school, whatever, has tremendous effects on human physical and mental health. Like study after study after study across the world has shown this. And so being able to drive down the cost and increase the availability of green space in our neighborhoods is something I'm really excited about as we scale Scythe up because I think more people deserve green space in their life, natural habitats, and the health and wellness that comes from that. And we talk a lot about food deserts in politics nowadays, but I think there's a very real green space desert thing happening in our cities where you just live in concrete jungles with no sense of nature and the anxiety that can build up from that is a huge one. So that's sort of the human health side. I think that's really exciting. But then also, if you look at the benefits to reducing the amount of air conditioning or heating that's needed by building up more green space, that's also huge. I don't recall the numbers offhand, but just having trees around buildings in urban environments can reduce the concrete heat island effect dramatically in cool cities, which reduces summer AC loads dramatically. And as anybody following it knows, reducing that peak is a huge part of shaving off the peaker plants and all of that. And so it can actually have a a really big impact just to plant some trees and keep your areas and plant some grass instead of building another concrete area, another parking lot that can be really helpful. So again, this is all sort of us looking to cultivate more green space by making it cheaper, making it easier for landscapers to do all of this work and to care for it in perpetuity, basically. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about is just these are a carbon sink as well. And I don't know what the significance yeah, of that absolutely. is, but healthy plants. Yeah, grass, <laughs> trees. Take CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? Yep, yep, they are. Actually, you mentioned this when we first met, and I think it's a good perspective just to consider for a minute that I think it's easy when you're thinking purely from a sustainability standpoint to think that big open mode grass landscaping is not the best thing we could be doing for the environment, right? There's a lot of water requirements. These are non-native species that need fertilizer and things like that. I think you said something. Well, anyway, I'm curious to hear what your perspective on that is. Yeah, totally. I think there's, when you're caring for highway medians and making them look as immaculate as Augusta National, there's not a lot of point to that, right? It's a highway median, let it be wild grasses. But I think the reality is, one, people need these natural areas to congregate in. And as nice as native grasses are, they're not great to like wade through. (laughs) You can't play soccer on a pitch of native grasses. And so we do need lots of these cultivated green spaces that are specifically tailored with turf grasses or similar environments. It's a lot better than putting synthetic turf down, which has been become a twisted way of being sustainable is to put plastic derived turf down that only lasts for a few years. And then you got to use a whole bunch more oil to make more plastics to make more fake grass instead of just planting yeah, carbon sinks that naturally are nice. And yeah, I guess the final part of it really just comes back to that human health and just having places to congregate. It's just nice yeah. to have open green areas to be in. I think the pandemic showed us we don't really have enough of those if people were actually using them as much as they'd like. You had the parks in San Francisco with the circles in it to force everybody to be super spread out. (laughs) And yeah, I look forward to folks having more green space, not less. I'm glad you brought up synthetic grass. I was going to ask about that. It does feel like if you can make a natural turf field more cost effective and have real grass replacing some of that synthetic turf. That would be amazing in so many ways. There are a lot of things I've found in this kind of climate change, sustainability conversation where cars are an example. I think from a purely sustainability standpoint, we would say ride your bike, walk more, don't drive your car. But actually, people are going to continue driving and there's a lot of good societal benefits to that. So let's give them the best way to do it. I see this as similar. Like, yes, we still need grass for a lot of reasons to maintain society and it's going to continue happening. Let's give ourselves the best and most sustainable tools to do it. 
Yeah, I think that's where our head's at. Yeah. Do we want to be mowing in Vegas? No, I would rather the Xeriscape in Vegas. It's the desert. Like, (laughs) you don't need to be building lawns there. But yeah, if you're in Kentucky or Florida, you're trying to have a nice space you can enjoy, like we should at least do that in a obviously net positive way and care for that space, not pollute and use fossil fuels in order to cut that grass. Yeah. I want to talk about the product itself. And if you could just give us a quick kind of description of what you're building, that would be a great place to start. Our machine's called M.52, Scythe M.52. It's a 52-inch stand-on all-electric autonomous commercial mower. It looks like any other 52-inch stand-on mower that landscapers might use on properties like campuses, schools, office parks, housing developments, apartment complexes, sort of any area that's not just a single family home, you might see somebody mow with one of these. It's got hand controls on the top so operators can operate it just like any other. Manual mower makes it basically the one mower that they need on their trucks. They don't need to have a gas mower as well to do the tricky areas. They can use ours do the tricky areas manually and then let it do the areas that are maybe a little more open autonomously. And then over time, we'll improve the autonomy, keep marching that along until we can do pretty much the whole property with basically the click of a button. Cool. And what was your process of developing this? I imagine there was some amount of customer needs discovery and interviewing to understand what exactly your product should look like. Did Was that a big focus for you early on? Yeah, I mean, getting in the field has really been our focus from day one and putting the robot out there and pressure testing it against the reality of trying to cut grass in the real world. Honestly, we didn't spend a lot of time sort of focus grouping and having conversations because when you're trying to invent something, I think as revolutionary in a lot of ways as an autonomous mower, your customers aren't going to know, they're not going to have a clear concept of what that means in their head. They're going to tell you what they want. They're going to tell you their problems. But I think it's up to the folks building it to actually throw things at the wall, see what works, and then iterate. And so in six years, we've built six different generations of our machine now. We're scaling the sixth generation, and the first four basically looked radically different from each other, entirely different form factors and concepts as we fumbled our way through to learning what would really work for landscapers. And ending up on this 52-inch size because it was kind of the workhorse size for landscapers. It's a common. It can do areas pretty quickly, but it can also fit into smaller, tighter spaces. And then the stand-on form factor, because we learned with our early walk-behinds, where basically you're not self-propelled, but you still have to walk on your own two and feet and chase it. We learned that landscapers actually like to use the machines as transport vehicles around the property. So if they've got to park at one end of a housing development and drive them or get their stuff a mile over, they don't want to carry it all and walk it. That would add half an hour to their day. And so they like to ride on the machine. And so we built a machine that, again, just fits right into their workflow. That was a key thing for us is not forcing landscapers to rethink everything about how they structure their day, just allow us to build a machine that could slot right in and be pretty natural for them. On the tech stack, how much have you had to innovate like your autonomy software and sensors? And how much are you able to leverage existing libraries or build on what's in the industry already? Yeah, I'll say we built pretty much everything from the ground up for our application. We have smart folks who have worked elsewhere and I'm sure bring inspiration and learnings from other companies in robotics. But really, there's not a lot of open source robotic stuff that works super well for our application or almost any. I think it's maturing and getting a lot better. But so many things in robotics are still so tailored to your application that we felt it was better to just write it from the ground up. We could get more performance out of it, tailor it to our application to make sure that we weren't compromising just to use an off-the-shelf thing and get much more performance out of it, which means we can use a smaller amount of compute, which means we save power, which means we have more battery to put into cutting the grass. And that's really where, again, it all feeds back into is how much time can we save a landscaper in a day? That's bottlenecked on how much battery do we have and how much battery do we use for anything that's not uh, blade spinning to cut grass. 
And frankly, even how much battery do we have to use to cut grass? We've designed our own blades even. Like you'd think, and I swear, I thought the earliest days, I was like, okay, well, at least we'll never have to design our own blades. Like we may be doing all our own software. Early on, we learned we had to design our own mower deck that we couldn't take one off the shelf. But even for the first few years, I was like, we don't have to do blades. Like we can just buy blades off the shelf. And one of our mechanical engineers actually tested a bunch of blades I was like, these are incredibly inefficient. Like they just, no one's had to think about efficiency in blade design and in mower blade design because you just put more gas in. It doesn't matter. So we, yeah, have, this, we have gone as far as designing wow. our own blades. And we'll start probably ramping those up next year as we look to get a lot of these out there and help customers do even more. Because it's just like every kilowatt hour has to be deployed as effectively as possible. Wow, that's surprising to me. What kind of impact does that have in terms of efficiency? How significant is that? can be like 8% in the overall power consumption because basically power going to the blades and the motors and the drive motors is probably 80-90% of our total power consumption. And so anything we can do, and it varies which one's more blades or traction depending on how thick the grass is you're cutting and how low you're cutting it. But a lot of the power goes into spinning blades to cut grass and then eject that grass out. And so anything we can do to make that better has a big impact overall. How does the autonomy work? What kind of data are you capturing? Yeah, so we got HDR automotive grade cameras on the machine, basically a stereo pair in each cardinal direction. So forwards, left, right, back. So it can see in depth anything around it, tell the difference between a dog and a park bench by doing semantic segmentation. We've got GPS on board, an acceler- accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, information from the wheels, and then ultrasonic sensors as well. It's the second layer of safety on the machine. And we kind of bring all of that together, create a 3D model of the world around us to understand where the machine is and how it's moving through the world and then to operate safely, basically, to react correctly to different types of obstacles, to different types of things around us, to plan effectively over an area. But the basic operation of the machine is the first time you bring M.52 to a new property that none of our machines have been at before, you drive it manually around the boundary of each mobile area. So if you've got the northwest corner of the camp, or the Southeast soccer field. You hit on the screen, you hit start a ton or start new mo zone, drive it around the boundary, hit finish. It saves that perimeter off, shares it with the rest of the M.52 and a customer's fleets. And then when you show up again, or if you want to cut it right then, you just put it inside that mo zone, point it the direction you want the stripes to go, hit start autonomous mo, pull the blades on, the PTO as they call it, and then it gives you a five-second countdown and you walk away. That's all it takes. Very cool. Did you have to collect a bunch of data for training and train the software yourselves? Yeah, so we have a data set of about 120,000 images now from a number of different states and lots of environments of basically landscaping scenes of all the sorts of things that we'd see out in the world from people to cars to trees and mulch beds. And we teach our models the difference between a sewer grate and a sprinkler box cover and a hole in the ground because they're all different in important ways. A sewer grate, we probably don't want to drive over, but could be okay The sprinkler valve box, we really don't want to drive over. They're plastic and they'll actually crack under the weight of a mower tire. So we'd like to avoid it. And a hole we would definitely like to avoid. (laughs) Or weeds versus bushes versus leaves even. So we brought a lot of landscaper expertise into our data set in a way that a generically labeled data set might not. It sounds incredible. It also sounds expensive like you've added cost to what you were describing as this kind of the cheap mowers that exist today, which makes me wonder about your business model and how your customers look at it from a payback period standpoint. Yeah, I think we're in still what I feel like is the equivalent of the 90s web era where anyone starting a web company in the 90s, you had to build your own HTTP server, you had to stand up your own data center, basically, because there was none of that sort of scaffolding for you, you know, Nginx didn't exist yet, run your web server. And so in this era of robotics, like, yeah, everyone's reinventing the wheel, candidly, basically, every robotics company reinvents probably a 
bunch of the same things that we've built for our applications. But I think that's a tremendous amount of industry learning happening to eventually come out with a world that is like web today, where, yeah, you just take Django or Rails and plug some things together and voila, you have an e-commerce site or something. And so I think on the business model side, it's similar, right? You've got all sorts of robotics companies approaching things in different ways. And when we sat down in the early days of Scythe to think about how we'd make money, how we'd demonstrate to our customers that we provided them value and they should pay us for it, it never sat well with us to take that same model of just selling a machine and then hoping it breaks so that they have to buy another one. We always wanted to incentivize everyone at Scythe unquestionably to work in the best interests of customers. Because I think when you have a mission that says one thing, but a way you make money that says a different thing, you just end up inevitably with conflict. I mean, just look at Google's mission to organize the world's information. How they make money is by serving you ads. <laughs> and so, unsurprisingly, you see a lot more ads than you do information in your searches today. And we didn't want that. And so the way we bill our customers, it's kind of a two-part model. There's a fixed price monthly lease where they pay a set amount every month to get the machine on their crew. We do all the maintenance for the core parts of the machine and they can use it under this lease for all the manual mowing that they want. So no limit on it, as many hours as they want of riding the thing around, whether it's as a transport vehicle or actually manually cutting grass. But then all of the autonomy is a secondary per acre fee on top of that. So we actually bill based on their usage. It's kind of akin to, a, for those in the web world, like a snowflake usage-based consumption model where we actually tally up all of the acres that they mow across a month and then have a secondary charge on their bill for that. And what that means is everyone at Scythe wants to build a machine that mows as fast as possible, never breaks down, and reliably works for customers because we don't get paid otherwise. And that's our kind of unconstrained upside is the acreage-based payment. The lease is great, secures our economics, helps to demonstrate to customers they don't want 15 of them to do one acre a day. They really want one to work as much as possible so they can stretch that lease payment out. And then, yeah, the autonomy all comes down to that acreage payment. So you have this awesome expertise built up now in, in autonomy and unstructured environments, these outdoor environments. What's on the sort of future roadmap? Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, we'll stick with M.52 until we've really got that at scale. So we want to have thousands of those around the country and make sure they are just unquestionably the best 52-inch class or above, frankly, mower that you can buy. And as we get there, we'll shift our focus into other types of mowing, bring this autonomy platform into smaller mowers and golf course mowers and solar farms and right-of-ways and all of these other environments where we can basically directly apply the expertise we've built up like one-to-one -one, with a different form factor of machine. Solar farms, for instance, often in the middle of nowhere, they would love to have them mowed autonomously. M.52 is not a fit because it's too tall. <laughs> um, solar fields, typically those panels are only about three feet or maybe three and a half feet up. And so you need a mower that's somewhere around two, two and a half feet tall. So we'd love to do that and contribute to lowering those O&M costs for solar farm operators. We've had a lot of inbound around that, but we just have to make a sort of more specialized machine that can live out in the middle of nowhere to care for all of that turf. So we'll take care of that. Oh, yeah. Would it sit there? At like a docking station until it's time? You mean like a, literally a robot would live there with the panels and just periodically mow and then come back to home and then go out and mow again and come back home? Most likely, yeah. One of the biggest costs. I mean, solar farm mowing, they pay like 100 plus dollars per acre for that mowing because it's usually a four hour drive <laughs> to get there. And so you got to have a whole crew that then spends four hours on the road. Talk about overhead and extra work that's not going to the acreage. And so, yeah, we'd likely build a machine that lived on site, had its own little charging hut. There are a few folks who have attempted this recently, but I think for one reason or another, it hasn't taken off. But then broadly speaking, like we want to help landscapers automate everything that they do taking care of their spaces. So that's the edging, the trimming, the seed depositing, the 
deposit grass seeds, spraying. We'd love to bring some of the ideas from precision agriculture into landscaping of, hey, I'm spraying herbicides to kill the weeds. I'd rather only spray it on the weeds, not on everything. But the equipment they have today is just, I ride it and I spray a lot of chemical on there. And that's not great. I think we can do a lot better with intelligent machines that do a kind of targeted spraying campaign. And then frankly, once we start on the path to automating more landscaping tasks, I'd love to bring this electromechanical autonomous systems expertise that we're building up and the software platform to play in other industries. I think there's a ton of mowing that's done in agriculture that our machines could be a great fit for. Construction has a lot of small equipment in it that can be automated that we can take a bottoms-up approach to automating instead of going straight for the giant machinery, we can rethink it from the ground up. That goes for both ag and construction. Why do we need tractors that are quite so large? If they're autonomous and all electric, could we have a fleet of smaller ones that do the same work, have less compaction on the soil, need less tilling, can foster that regenerative agricultural operations better. And I think that really gets more feasible once you have these small electric autonomous systems. Exciting stuff. What kind of time frame are you thinking about for these tackling other tasks in landscaping and then actually expanding into other industries? I think we'll get beyond M.52 in the next couple years, and then we'll see how quickly we can get into other things. Deer's 130 years old now, so I think we got a long path ahead of us. But I think we can move a little bit faster than they did into new markets. I think you can move a little faster. Yeah. Okay. I have three final questions for you. The first is how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of the planet and why? I'm very optimistic. I think the seeing California's energy prices go 100% solar uh, at various times of the day, I think these last few months, the increasing adoption of solar and renewables in China that's going at a rate that's, I think, faster than anyone in their wildest dreams would have predicted over the last few years. Yes, they're still building coal plants, but they're building solar and wind so much faster. The energy that we have in this country around deploying more solar around new technologies, around reshoring manufacturing to help support all of those industries. I'm very optimistic. I think humanity has shown an ability to be very creative when the stakes are high. And I think there's a recognition that the stakes are pretty damn high nowadays. So people are getting real creative. Love it. Who is one other person or company doing something to address climate change that's inspiring you? Peter Reinhardt that you had on, it's kind of a cop-out since he's who connected us, but he's doing great stuff over at Charm. Love what they're up to right over here yeah. in Colorado, storing oil underground, and then always a big fan of AMP, now AMP Sortation, nay, AMP Robotics oh, yeah. in Louisville, Colorado, who's sorting our trash better. And I think we'll have some really cool things coming down the line and single stream compostable sorting versus recycling and trash and just finding better ways to sequester a lot of the gases that come off of our or prevent a lot of the gases that come off our waste streams. Yeah, another great use case for robotics. Yeah, talk about dirty, dull, and dangerous. Yeah, exactly. What advice do you have for someone not working in climate tech today who wants to do something to help? I think there are so many opportunities out there, so many great companies that are looking for amazing people. Figure out how you can apply whatever skills you have. There are, yeah, endless number of companies or take the leap and do something yourself. It doesn't have to be a venture backable, can knock a half gigaton off the worldwide emissions. Every company, I think, fighting to electrify and reduce emissions makes a dent and it all moves the window of what people are focusing on towards optimism and towards action, which I think is really important for us to solve the problems ahead of us. Awesome. Jack, that was really fun. I learned a lot. And yeah, I'm inspired by what you're doing. It sounds like both a big opportunity, and something that solves a real need and also is good for the planet. So thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Dylan. Appreciate it. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. 
On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.